We'll make a start because we're, uh, we're pretty tight on time for the rest of the day. So um, we are privileged to have three excellent speakers this afternoon to discuss information warfare trends in Asia. Um, I suspect and have been informed that that will involve a focus primarily on two states of, of significant interest in, in the region. Um, we will go in order of the speakers listed, unless anyone's got an objection. Um, so our first speaker is Dr Michael Clark from the National Security College and I'll pass straight to him. Great. Um, thanks first to Herore for, for inviting uh, me to speak uh, today. Um, I suppose there's uh, no, no surprise in guessing the, the focus uh, for myself uh, this afternoon. So looking specifically at China uh, and information war, uh, and in particular how it conceives of the concept of information war, but also how it relates to its foreign and domestic uh, security issues. Um, so first off, I'd like to suggest here that the, the uh, China's approach is really framed by the strategy known as the three warfares. Uh, and this divides information war into three realms, psychological warfare, public opinion or media warfare, and legal warfare. Uh, it is often conceived of uh, the concept of the three warfares as geared primarily against external adversaries or potential ones. However, I'd like to sort of suggest towards the sort of second half of my remarks here uh, that it has important domestic targets, particularly uh, with respect to the issue of Xinjiang and, and Uyghur terrorism. However, overall, the purpose, I think, is, is the same, to achieve politico-military goals without the use of kinetic means. Uh, so in terms of application, uh, the three warfares has, again, has a, has a number of understandings and applications in Chinese strategic thinking. In particular, there are three levels of application, tactical, campaign or theatre operations and strategic operations. I'm primarily going to look at uh, the three warfare, warfares in terms of how it operates at the strategic level. Now, at the strategic level in Chinese thinking, there is also, again, another division, national level, national security level, and a military strategy. Uh, the national strategic level is particularly interesting um, because it's not, about, not necessarily about military strategy. It's about protecting national interests uh, and national security. So in this context, the three warfares are offensive and defensive activities to protect what China often refers to as comprehensive national security. So under this label of comprehensive national security, not only comes territorial sovereignty, security from military threats and so forth, but also primarily what we in the West would term regime security or state security. So a focus on security of China's political system, security of the Chinese Communist Party's hold on power, uh, and also wider issues to do with na uh, national unity. So here, the ongoing activities uh, under the three warfares are conceived in Chinese writings as very much as a continuum uh, across what you might refer to as a peace crisis and, and war scenarios. So this suggests fundamental difference in Chinese and Western conceptions, not only of the nation, notion of information war, but also I think the notion of, uh, of, of, sorry, the conception of politics itself. So in terms of, of origins, before I, I dive into uh, perhaps some of the more substantive elements of my remarks, uh, the three warfares has been defined by Chinese strategic culture and also post-Cold War geopolitical or, or geostrategic changes. In terms of strategic culture, uh, Chinese information war is very much framed by uh, uh, the classical uh, elements of Chinese strategy. For example, Sun Tzu's often quoted uh, notion that to defeat the enemy uh, without battle is the acme of skill. It's also informed by legalist interpretations uh, or, or, pardon me, an instrumentalist view of the law, i.e. legal codes are there to be used as a means of enforcing social and political control. Uh, and, and this is very much uh, runs into the Chinese Communist Party's approach to political power. In terms of geostrategic developments in the post-Cold War period, uh, three core events have been uh, identified by Chinese strategists here. The first is Gulf War, the first Gulf War in 1991. Uh, NATO and American intervention in Kosovo in 1999, and, and the second Gulf War in 2003. Uh, for the PRC, uh, from, from the PRC perspective, 
Each of these conflicts uh, demonstrated the US superiority in information war and the way in which China conceives of it. So in terms of some of the wider issues to do with the content of the strategy of three warfares, psychological warfare is essentially about influencing and disrupting decision-making capabilities, fostering doubt about adversaries' capabilities and demoralising uh, military and civilian leadership. Uh, the media and public opinion warfare is about uh, activities to influence and condi condition perceptions, uh, and this has been carried out uh, throughout a variety of means, print, television, online media, social networks. Uh, for example, you would have heard quite a bit about Sina Weibo and, and, and the Communist Party's so-called two million public opinion analysts who are paid uh, to contribute uh, various elements on social media forums. Uh, legal warfare is also uh, about exploiting legal systems, customs and conventions, both internationally and domestically, for political and economic and strategic gain. Internationally, uh, the most uh, obvious or, and recent element of China's engagement in legal warfare has been China's uh, 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 idiosyncratic uh, understanding and interpretation of UNCLOS uh, with respect to the South China Sea. It's important to note here in each of these streams of the three warfares is that the audience is both domestic and global publics. This is about shaping narratives and expectations of Chinese power. So this brings me to the issue of, of Xinjiang. So in terms of, of, of Xinjiang, in terms of some background context, the key issue has been long-standing ethnic grievances. However, uh, since uh, 2001, and certainly in the last uh, five or six years, uh, there has been uh, an intensification of China's approach uh, to overcome what it sees as dangerous elements of Uyghur ethnic, ethnic identity, particularly as it relates to Islam. So here, the first, the first image, uh, well actually both of these images relate to what is termed informal, uh, sorry, uh, abnormal and abnormal uh, Islamic dress uh, and appearance. So the, 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 the picture on, on the left here uh, publicising uh, uh, the banning of certain elements of Islamic dress and following the niqab, the full uh, head-to-body dress. The second uh, frame, which is part of a Xinjiang pectoral competition uh, that ethnic minorities are encouraged to enter, uh, displaying in their own works of art official party policy, uh, demonstrating the party's view of Islamic dress. The second major element of China's activities with respect to uh, overcoming uh, what it terms the, the, the corrosive influence of traditional ideologies and, and religion it is well captured in, in this particular uh, piece of art from, from, from that competition. Participating in extremist activities is playing with, with fire. Uh, very much a sustained campaign across Xinjiang to, uh, to paint uh, religiosity in particular and outward displays of, of Islamic identity as running counter uh, to the national unity of the PRC. So how does this reflect uh, elements of the three warfares? Well, it, it reflects each element in particular. Psych in terms of psychological warfare, it's about diminishing Uyghur capability and political will to overtly oppose the, com the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and this is achieved through a variety of means. In particular, through the institution of, of regular yearly strike hard campaigns aimed at a people's war against the so-called three evils. And the three evils are separatism, extremism, and terrorism. Uh, and this is done in a, in, in a variety of means, from monitoring of, of mosques and religious institutions, uh, and through to the legal side of the equation. So this is about, you, know, you read in Chinese publications, countering terrorism according to the law, very much reflecting uh, the legalist tradition uh, of, of Chinese legal, legal thought, uh, where you have a very instrumentalist view of, of the law. So here, elements of Uyghur identity and ethnicity are in fact characterised as illegal. Uh, and this is what a French uh, scholar of, of Xinjiang and the Uyghurs has termed the judici judici judicialization of Islam in Xinjiang. So you have the promulgation over the last three or four years of extensive legal codes stipulating what, it, what is in fact illegal and legal religious activities, ranging right through from establishing so-called illegal uh, Islamic schools, underground mosques in, in, in actuality, right through to the wearing of beards and the wearing of headscarves. 
Finally, you also have as the uh, ultimate uh, bedrock of, of, of this approach uh, what uh, James Liebold, uh, who, a scholar at Latrobe, terms the emerging security state in Xinjiang. So you have mass display of the Chinese state's hard power. Uh, not only uh, this hard power, but it's also coupled with uh, an increased surveillance state, uh, including uh, the imposition of various CCT TV surveillance networks in major urban centres, development of facial recognition technology that's used in uh, uh, to, to determine access to particularly sensitive areas, for example, the Idkar Mosque in Kashgar, which is uh, the spiritual home of, of Uyghur Islam. This, however, contrasts uh, with some of the global aspects of China's handling of the Xinjiang issue and, and Uyghur terrorism in particular. So here we have a new front, if you will, in China's information war as it relates to Xinjiang. Um, you're probably familiar with Xi Jinping's signature foreign policy initiative, which is the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and the Belt and Road Initiative, at least rhetorically, is about, form, uh, about uh, encouraging trans-Eurasian trans economic connectivity. Uh, and some of these materials uh, that have been specifically targeted at Middle Eastern and Central Asian audiences are quite interesting. Uh, they can oppose what seems to be a very favourable favorable Chinese Communist Party view of, of Islamic dress, Islamic customs and, and, and Islamic identity more broadly with what it's actually doing in Xinjiang itself, uh, which is very much uh, essentially about assimilation and integration and also control of, of Uyghur ethnic identity and expression. So ultimately, the Chinese Communist Party's information war as it relates to Xinjiang has two primary goals, as encapsulated by these two pieces of art from the Xinjiang uh, pictorial competition. Uh, the first here on the left uh, supposedly dis displays uh, at the bottom an extremist family and at the top a de-extremised or counter-radicalised family displaying what the CCP hopes to achieve with respect to its Uyghur population in Xinjiang. Uh, the second, uh, perhaps not so subtle, uh, uh, diagram here is, in fact, the so-called bulldozer state, the hard power of the Chinese Communist Party and, in fact, its security organs crushing uh, the, the black hands of Uyghur separatism and terrorism. So, in conclusion, The three warfares clearly have uh, both external and domestic uh, implementation and reflects the Chinese Communist Party's view of politics as, uh, as, as going across a peace crisis and war continuum. However, what is problematic for the party state, particularly with respect to Xinjiang and the wider Belt and Road Initiative, concerns the contradiction between its external messaging, uh, as displayed in some of the favourable uh, views of, of Islam and ethnic identity that it portrays under Belt and Road, and the reality of what it's doing on the ground in Xinjiang. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, uh, our next speaker I think everyone's familiar with, uh, Professor Rory Metcalf, who's the head of the National Security College. Um, if you'd like to join us, um, in the interest of time, I think I'll keep the... Bio. Everyone's got the bios for everyone, so we'll keep it fairly brief. Thanks very much. Thanks. It looks like it's been a fantastic conference, and I'm sorry I couldn't be here earlier in the day. I think you've been competing with uh, the uh, Australian Institute of International Affairs and, and holding your own here uh, really well. So congratulations to Ferraro and colleagues uh, on the conference today. I'm going to offer just a few brief remarks uh, looking particularly at uh, what I would define as Chinese uh, influence, uh, if you want to call it interference, feel free, uh, but the different levels of Chinese influence uh, in Australia in recent years, and I guess a little bit about what that perhaps tells us about the, the changing nature of Chinese strategy when it comes to the information dimension, to uh, really the strategic use of information and, and propaganda to advance China's uh, domestic and foreign policy objectives. So I'll, I'll talk specifically about the Australian experience in a moment, but just, I guess, a few words of context first, following on from, I think, Michael's remarks. I think it's very clear under the, uh, the current Chinese leadership, uh, it's, very, it's very clear that under, under Xi Jinping, we, we've seen really the precise opposite of what 
uh, some China watchers had anticipated five or six years ago uh, when we saw the transition to this leadership. In other words, we've seen, uh, we've seen a China that is, um, that is very outwardly focused, that uh, we've seen a Chinese leadership that draws a very, very clear uh, thread between China's, uh, the, their, their domestic stability and legitimacy challenges uh, at home and China's engagement abroad. And in particular, we've seen, a, uh, I think, a growing emphasis on the, the mobilisation and indeed the influence of Chinese diaspora uh, in the region, in the Indo-Pacific and indeed in the world to advance Chinese uh, state and party objectives. Now, a lot of that now may seem to be fairly uncontroversial, but it's only five or six years ago that I think many observers were anticipating that, in fact, we would see a very strong focus on economic development and on uh, uh, really the, the, um, the uh, maintenance of a, uh, of a set of policies based around non-interference. So having said that, I think we've seen in Australia in the last couple of years uh, a number of, of data points that point to, I guess, the, the kind of strategy, the kind of influence that we're going to see from China uh, in influencing both public and political opinion in other countries in years to come. And I think in many ways, Australia is proving to be something of a bellwether uh, in this regard, because what do, we, what do we have in the Australian context? Uh, at a strategic level, obviously, we have a country that's a middle power and, among other things, a, uh, a defence and intelligence ally of the United States. Uh, a country that, uh, that is really seen in China as part of uh, a US-led regional order that is out to, if not contain, because I don't sort of buy the containment line, but is certainly out to balance and uh, limit China's strategic influence uh, a, as it rises. We've also got a country that has two other interesting characteristics that I think have made and are making Australia something of a priority in, um, in China's emphasis on um, political influence and uh, propaganda. And that is, firstly, that um, there's very, uh, a deep and growing economic relationship. China is broadly good for the Australian economy, um, broadly indeed uh, becoming pretty critical to the Australian economy. But there's also a societal dimension that's particularly interesting, and that is that to the extent that the legitimacy of the uh, Communist Party leadership and the, the system in China depends on a, uh, I guess, a, a very clear narrative and a very clear uh, sense of, of, of consent uh, within China, then the existence of countries abroad that provide essentially sanctuaries for dissenting opinion um, is going to be increasingly problematic for the Chinese regime. So you, we've seen, I think, if you look at the objectives of uh, Chinese activities in Australia aimed at um, influence, I think we've seen two uh, really distinct and overriding objectives. One is uh, that there is, I believe, an effort to, uh, to increasingly limit the, uh, the, the tightness of the Australia-US alliance. You could argue that Donald Trump's doing a pretty good job of that on his own, thank you very much, uh, and that, you know, I think is true. Uh, but having said that, even if Trump wasn't in the picture, you've got, I think, an effort to uh, to really drive something of a wedge between the allies. Um, now, it's true, in my view, that Australia has um, an independent foreign policy, but it's an increasingly popular mantra that you hear among some commentators that we need an independent foreign policy because we don't allegedly have one. And I think one of the challenges for policymakers there is to avoid the trap of assuming that an independent foreign policy is one that privileges Chinese interests over those of other countries in the region. So there's an alliance dimension. But the second dimension that I think is just as important, possibly even more important, to understand uh, why we've seen an increase in uh, Chinese uh, propaganda, information, influence activities in Australia in recent years, is to limit uh, and indeed to suppress wherever pos possible the criticism of the regime that occurs on Australian soil among the very diverse Chinese communities uh, that we have in this country. And I think that, in a sense, is, is actually more troubling from a sovereignty point of view than the, than the anti-alliance dimension of, um, of Chinese information operations, because this is, this is really, in part, about the, uh, you know, the, the values and the legitimacy of freedom of speech <coughs> within Australia. And it, I guess the extent to which any foreign power seeks to limit freedom of speech in any part of the Australian community uh, can manifest as, as, as really a, a challenge to, uh, to our liberal democratic system, but also 
a challenge to the notion that all Australian nationals deserve equal protection of their, of their freedom of speech. So we have, a, we have something, of, something of a problem. Now, uh, those of you who followed this debate in the Australian media, which has been quite robust in the last year or two, would know that Australia is not the only country that's experiencing uh, various degrees of, um, of Chinese uh, influence and propaganda. And I think you'd also be aware that there is uh, a debate that we need to engage with, which is that uh, to, a large, to a degree, uh, influence and propaganda from any country can and should be an acceptable part of the discourse uh, in, in any second country, because after all, we want in a multicultural society to engage voices from all parts of the community in debate about this country's future. The, um, the problem arises when uh, there's evidence that there's essentially foreign state uh, and indeed foreign political party uh, mobilisation of this debate and a, a genuinely propagandist element to what should be uh, a free and open debate in Australian society. I'd also note, uh, as I said at the outset, that Australia is not the only country where we're seeing increased efforts at influence, whether it's through uh, political donations, whether it's through the, uh, the purchase of space in uh, mainstream media organs, whether it's through the apparent uh, purchase or indeed intimidation of, uh, of independent media voices, or whether it's through uh, some, some pretty interesting relationships that we see in, um, in the, the think tank and the university space. Uh, New Zealand has had its own uh, recent experiences in this regard that have had a lot of attention. Uh, Canada's beginning to uh, look at the Australian experience and see what it can learn. And indeed, in a number of other countries, including Singapore and a number of Euro European powers as well, we're seeing these debates quite alive. So look, a couple of, um, a couple of general points I want to leave you with, and hopefully we can, we can open a bit of a conversation about this. Uh, firstly, I'm not sure that it's correct to characterise what is happening as soft power. Um, of course, by any conventional academic definition of soft power, the, the Joe Nye definition, soft power is the power of, of attraction, of, in other words, of being able to put a, a well-argued, evidence-based, competing narrative into the debate and seeking to essentially attract or persuade uh, other voices on the other side to the... Um, the, the correctness and legitimacy of your perspective on the world. And so soft power works best when governments don't do it, when it's done essentially by non-government entities, um, private sector or, or academic or others. The other point to note is that um, if you look at the, uh, the, the rather credible reports that have emerged in the Australian debate, whether it's about political donations, whether it's about uh, mobilisation of community organisations, uh, ostensibly as independent organisations, but with some pretty significant evidence that these are directed or driven, um, if not by the Chinese Communist Party, then by the United Front Work Department, uh, which is, of course, the, the bridge to, um, to others uh, beyond the Communist Party. I think it's, it's, it's pretty clear that much of this has a strategic objective. Uh, th those objectives that I've spoken of. And so, again, uh, it's debatable as to whether, it, whether this, uh, this phenomenon is, is spontaneous, is, is driven by community groups uh, on their own accord, or whether it, in fact, has the, the active um, support, tacit support of, um, of official, um, official channels. A couple of thoughts to leave you with about the policy challenges that this leaves for liberal democracies. Um, firstly, as I said at the outset, the response to dealing with a propagandist challenge, uh, whether it's you know, trying to change Australia's narrative uh, or Australia's policy positions on issues that are sensitive to China, such as the South China Sea, or whether it's seeking to really squeeze, if not eliminate, Australia's status as a sanctuary for uh, dissident and dissenting views on issues ranging from uh, Tibet to Tiananmen to uh, Taiwan. Uh, lots of T words there. Um, the, the challenge is essentially the same for government, and that is how do you, I guess, identify and counter uh, propaganda and often intrusive foreign state influence without uh, resorting to what essentially would appear to be uh, a McCarthyist set of responses. In other words, without imposing um, some kind of censorship regime of your own, uh, some kind of uh, set of legal sanctions that could, of course, uh, tarnish or capture uh, innocent people in their web. Um, one of the risks, of course, uh, for all of this in a multicultural society like Australia is precisely that, that fear 
that any criticism of Chinese state or party influence inside Australia can fan uh, attitudes of xenophobia, attitudes uh, potentially of, of racism uh, and so forth. And of course that needs to be guarded against. That's really a reason why this set of issues has to be owned by the political mainstream and a bipartisan consensus in Australia. And it's also a reason why I think it, it's quite strikingly positive that a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the awareness and criticism of Chinese state influence in Australia is coming from Chinese community figures and Chinese community groups in this country. Um, there was, for example, a recent publication by uh, The Independent, the Chinese Australian newspaper uh, Vision Times, putting together about 20 odd personal uh, accounts of uh, Chinese state influence in Australia, uh, more than half of which were by uh, essentially Australians of, of Chinese origin. So, as I said, this needs to be an issue that is owned by the political mainstream uh, and that reflects the diversity of voices in the, um, in, the in the Chinese and other migrant communities in this country. Um, one last observation that, um, that might be useful, and one is that, uh, we, which is, of course, uh, bearing in mind that, um, as I said, the best soft power, uh, or indeed the best propaganda, doesn't tend to come from, uh, from governments, um, is that if there is going to be a state response to this, it needs to involve not only, I think, a, um, a legislative framework that, for example, limits or bans uh, foreign political donations, and we're seeing some progress on that score now, but perhaps also an institutional response, so, so that, for example, following the Canadian example, there's no reason why Australia couldn't have a ministerial responsibility for something like the protection of democratic institutions. Um, but it remains to be seen whether the Australian political class really grips up this set of problems or whether uh, a couple of years from now, everything I've said uh, is very much a matter, of, uh, a matter of history and we see a continued um, erosion of the, uh, I guess, the, uh, the free debate on these issues in this country. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Rory. Um, I'd like to ask Dr Petrov to come up. Uh, he's an alumni of the ANU and extensively qualified to speak on Korea and Russia and a range of other information operations aspects. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be invited by the friendly Department of International Relations. We can say I'm from School of uh, Culture, History and Language, so and I, I'm offering the cultural approach to to the <coughs> inter-Korean conflict and the Korean War, uh, which, as you know, uh, technically was between 1950 and 53, but um, uh, as I claim, and my students are here, they don't uh, probably wouldn't disagree with me that the Korean War is still continuing. So today I'm going to talk about the propaganda war um, and the war uh, for the hearts and minds. Uh, the Korean War, just briefly, uh, from the beginning, from the start, it was the uh, civil war for unification started by North Korea. Uh, but very quickly it turned into international conflict, the proto, like a surrogate World War III with the intervention of uh, international forces who tried also help to uh, help uh, South Koreans to unify the country, but unsuccessfully. So the front line was going up and down and um, the war turned into a hybrid war. The war without rules, the war where conventional kinetic uh, movements were combined with propaganda and subversive acts and each side tried to avoid attribution and retribution. So the current situation where there is neither war nor peace and there's no peace on the Korean, peace, no peace regime in Korea right now, um, still inherited these elements of uh, hybrid war, uh, propaganda war, uh, where um, each side is simply trying to claim its own legitimacy and impose any possible, uh, uh, <coughs> any, any possible means to win the, the other. But my paper and my presentation today is trying to claim that uh, they're not doing it very well. The propaganda war is highly unsuccessful, at least for North and South Korea vis-a-vis -vis, uh, each other's population. So the um, hostilities of the Korean War ended uh, with uh, the signing of armistice agreement, uh, where the demilitarized zone uh, was established uh, four kilometers, uh, a strip of land, um, no man land, and it's a misnomer. It's a highly, it's highly militarized uh, piece of land. 
Um, uh, so to, you can't deceive people. Also the tunnels, you see the tunnels uh, which, uh, which were dug by apparently North Koreans, again, were uh, used uh, for, pro for propaganda to scare South Koreans or, or on the opposite, to give them some confidence that North Korean brothers and sisters will soon arrive. So uh, don't worry, we will come back and liberate you. Um, the joint security area, well, again, it's, it's, it's very insecure periodically. There's some shooting, uh, skirmishings, and uh, even the uh, axe murder incident happened uh, in 1976. So, but uh, the demilitarized zone, the joint security uh, area itself is uh, just manifestation of this continuing Cold War in Korea. We can't really uh, say that Cold War finished in Northeast Asia, and the hot spot is in Korea, and the demilitarized zone is, is the one. So everything about this area is about propaganda. There are two propaganda villages, one north of the demilitarized zone, where North Koreans have the largest tower with the biggest flag, uh, and they pretend that they uh, have the huge harvest, uh, much, much, much richer harvest than in South Korea, but of course uh, we know that it's not. In South Korean propaganda villages as well, they have the population where they who t uh, till the land and the uh, population is uh, uh, exempt from military service. Uh, but we know it's actually it's uh, Korean Central Te Intelligence agents who are working there as peasants. So 64 years after the war, what we, what we see right now, it's a, it's a natural, it's a, it's a disaster. It's a division of the peninsula, a division of the nation, which uh, history probably hasn't seen before. There is no um, communication, no postal, no telephone, no ra radio and television signals are jammed. Everything is done deliberately to avoid the people of North and South Korea to understand each other, to communicate with each other, and of course visit each other. So propaganda war is waged by uh, most mm, primitive ways, right? They don't use uh, anything more sophisticated than uh, helium balloons or you know, megaphone diplomacy with uh, loudspeakers which shout propaganda at each other. They used to stop, you know, suspend this uh, propaganda from both North and South uh, side during the so-called sunshine policy, the policy of peace and prosperity when North and South Koreans traded, communicated, visited each other, but it was discontinued by uh, the conservative government of Lee Myung-bak uh, some 10, 10 years ago. Uh, helium balloons, uh, how useful is that? Well, because they can't um, travel, and uh, these days they still, mm, you know, the national security law prevents North and South Koreans from visiting each other, and there are tens of thousands of separated families who haven't seen each other for the last 74 years. Well, they, uh, South Korean uh, activists and North Korean defectors uh, try to send some messages, and they send, uh, mm, you know, ra drop radios and, uh, and put, sometimes they put letters and and, and propaganda materials. And North Koreans even, even use the hard copies of propaganda materials, little laminated pieces of paper with crude propaganda, which is designed to influence uh, South Koreans' opinion. In fact, it doesn't. So what is going on? What South Koreans send to, to the North with, say, the helium balloons? Well, apart from the, uh, from the radio uh, receivers, which are prohibited to North Korea, they are listening to the uh, uh, foreign radio is a crime, which can be um, punished by imprisonment. Um, well, these days, uh, South Koreans tend to send a kind of um, small devices like USB and SD cards. What do they put on those useful thumb drives? Well, they put a little bit of propaganda. South Korean you know, K-pop, soap operas, TV dramas, which, which are watched in North Korea secretly. But again, they're not very effective in, well, except for the fashion design and, you know, North Korea is a paradise for uh, fashion makers, uh, you know, designer brand bags and shoes. What else? Uh, Western film, <laughs> The Interview, 2014, uh, which is also, you know, supposed to influence North Korean mind, but uh, I'm not sure it's, uh, you know, going, you know, accepted well by the North Korean audience. What do South Koreans actually do to encourage North Korean brothers and sisters to watch it? They add a one dollar US uh, uh, bill to uh, add some value to the soft uh, power, uh, which they try to <coughs> impose on North Koreans. What North Koreans send to South Korea? Well, it's even, uh, even worse than that. So they send political cartoons, which are outdated, which, um, you know, like uh, dates of North Korean 
national holidays like Kim Il Sung's birthday or some cartoons of Obama and you know, future President Trump, something which is completely, well, irrelevant. North Koreans know that Americans are evil, so they don't need to uh, <laughs> em emphasize that. South Koreans, probably many South Koreans agree with them after the uh, importation of American thought system that you know, particularly the relations between South Korea and China was so badly damaged by, by this alliance. Um, and, and South Korean uh, ch school children are um, well encouraged uh, and rewarded for collecting this uh, um, paper-based uh, propaganda and returning to, to the police uh, without reading it. And nobody in South Korea is going to read it because they're much more uh, computer advised. They, they spend days and nights uh, on their computers and social media. They're not going to read North Korean propaganda. So do North Koreans. They also love... Um, um, signs of modernization and little gadgets and uh, uh, with the arrival of uh, Kim Jong-un, the new leader who himself was uh, very fond of uh, gadgets and uh, studied in, uh, in Europe, um, the image of modern and uh, prosperous advanced nation um, began to be visible on the streets. You can see the propaganda post, uh, computerized numeric uh, century, we're going to be with the world and see of course the image of rocket in the 105 story hotel uh, also you know aiming uh, aiming high so it it all now probably if we understand how it works the propaganda works in north korea for maybe this uh, north korean um, rocket uh, nuclear program can be understood not as an attempt to rule the world and attack uh, some us territories in the pacific but simply to um, you know praise themselves and uh, make uh, themselves like uh, proud and happy about what the nation is doing. And the new generation of North Koreans, the so-called Changmadang generation, market generation, uh, is completely different from their fathers and grandfathers. Um, they grew up already in, after 1990s. Many of them were born after the famine of 1990s. Um, they actively participate in market activities, go overseas and work and learn languages and and computer technologies, uh, but they're still con uh, conditioned by this uh, old um, communist Chuche style uh, ideology and propaganda. So they they are brainwashed, but at the same time they kind of you know that's that's the element of, of life in a socialist country. Um, Kyle knows you know you have you need sort of a partition. Uh, your hard drive must be partitioned. One part of your hard drive is for uh, public places, and one part of your uh, computer operates for families and friends, and you must be very careful you know, not to mix this. But, you know, the school education, an important part of education is, of course, a very strongly anti-American, anti-imperialist, kill the Yankee, bastard guy, it's fun. Uh, of course, uh, South Koreans don't relate to this. South Koreans um, want to, you know, go to the United States and study, so for them, this propaganda simply doesn't make any, any sense. Uh, but in North Korea, it does, because North Koreans don't go overseas, and if they do, well, they're not supposed to talk much about uh, what they've experienced upon their return. But when they return again, there's like new drive for new gadgets. Uh, North Korean produced uh, tab, some Gion uh, kind of tablet. Uh, how, many, uh, how many mobile phones does this lady have? Probably one, two, maybe third one here. So the more mobile phones you have, so the more business you can do. So you are supposed to be a modern person constantly in contact. The problem is that you can't really uh, receive telephone calls from outside of the country. Sometimes they can't even get communicate between the cities. It should be very, very restricted, very much, very controlled. Again, uh, if you have this beautiful tab, what can you read? How useful is that? Because there's no connection, no World Wide Web access, and even they deliberately, you know, uh, uh, don't build any Wi-Fi receptors into these devices. So it's probably good to study the works of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un. Maybe you can read the newspaper, the old edition. There's no, no news in North Korea anyway. So they have the same uh, one TV channel, uh, only which starts in the afternoon, not in the morning. I was in Pyongyang last year and I completely forgot about this. I, I started turning on the TV and it was not working in the morning. So I went downstairs to the reception of Koryo Hotel saying, you know, something is wrong with my TV. I can't, I can't watch the morning news. And they told me, we don't have morning news. <laughs> it starts 4 p.m. only. <laughs> so, well, with new, uh, new entertainment, you see, Kim Jong-un was very uh, inventive and very in entertainment orientated. His wife is a, is a singer of um, 
Yun Ha Su, Ban Sok, Kim Jong Un uh, sort of encouraged all film male music Moran Bong uh, band to portray the image of modernity and play Western music. And even in the national TV, you can see Minnie and Mickey Mouse parading in 2011. <coughs> 2012. Uh, but, um, well, does it mean that North Korea is now more than Western? I know absolutely not. They're playing the Moran Bong um, halftime. They play Western music halftime. It's old, patriotic, revolutionary military songs. How many minutes? Two minutes. Right. Um, some case studies. Uh, military. See, the propaganda actually wor used to work somehow, but maybe the wrong way. One American soldier, an uh, American defector, Joe Dresnick, you know, while on, uh, on guard in, in the demilitarized zone, crossed the, crossed the DMZ, went to North Korea, but couldn't return. He was one of the six uh, American uh, nationals who um, uh, stayed there for, for, for life, working as English English um, the teacher and also the propaganda actor for the, for the films. Uh, he gave the story of his life to uh, uh, Daniel, um, uh, Daniel Gordon, the uh, British film director in, his, in the documentary, Crossing the Line. Can you see this demilitarized zone, the uh, 38th uh, parallel di uh, division actually affected the life of Americans too. Now he has two sons living in Pyongyang, also parading as uh, uh, film stars and, and, and the younger son, uh, James, is uh, also the military uh, officer and they, they dream about making North Korea strong and, and prosperous and giving interview to the uh, pro-North Korean American uh, newsletter. Not all Americans are as successful in North Korea as Joe Dresnick and, and his sons. Uh, Otto Wambia uh, experienced uh, a major um, <coughs> Uh, catastrophic uh, event. It's really not clear what happened there. He, he did upset the North Korean uh, host, the, the government. Um, and after his uh, emotional, uh, uh, after, after, after his admission of the guilt, well, North Koreans had no other choice but to uh, sentence him to 15 years of uh, hard labor. What did uh, Otto Wambia do is still not clear because if we look at the propaganda poster which was used um, as, um, as evidence, for the, uh, for the show trial, the one part of the poster is masked. We don't know the name of the leader. What did, what did Otto Wambia do? You know, desecrated the, the, the you know, vandalized the poster. It's not clear, but something really bad happened and it ended tragically. And I believe that Otto Wambia is simply uh, you know, one of the victims of the ongoing Korean conflict. <clears throat> South Korea, well, South Korea also lives at war and they try to influence their, their people and their advertisement in South Korea on every telephone booth. Uh, everywhere you can see this little poster with the telephone number 111. It's a, an invitation from the cent <coughs> Korean Central Intelligence Agency to Dobin spies. And if you want to be rich, so you can <coughs> catch a spy or sympathizer. But strangely, prices didn't change. You know, when I was a student there in 1990, it's exactly the same prices, so <laughs> how come? South Korean pop also is now being used for propaganda, anti-communist propaganda. The whole you know, the, uh, the, the, um, uh, ideology of South Korea is anti-communism. So if you're in South Korea and if you see the lovely uh, ladies from uh, all-female uh, Hello Venus group, they sing a song um, that uh, under the torch of uh, communist eradication, we will willingly sacrifice our lives. South Korean song, very popular. And uh, North Korean defectors, finally, we're just getting closer to the end. See, North Koreans, uh, North Koreans have, uh, there uh, was a trickle first uh, of North Korean defectors. Now there are 30,000 plus North Korean defectors there. And they're often used by South Koreans uh, for propaganda purposes. They go to schools and they go on national TV and talk about horrors of life in North Korea. But then some of them actually decide to redefect and go back to North Korea and, ho and tell, you know, in North Korean national TV about horrors of life in South Korea. And they seem to be quite sincere about that because unemployment in South Korea is very high. And this lady, um, Im, Im ji Yeon or Im, Rim ji um, she was welcomed by South Koreans, worked as a, as a star, uh, you know, paraded as, a, in, um, <clears throat> as a, in commercials. And then last month surfaced in North Korea, um, blaming 
South Koreans, you know, being cruel, being, uh, you know, double, double standards and, and discrimination against North Koreans simply because they speak with accent. So, to finalize, what conclusions we can make from all this long-term continuing standing division? See, the truth in Korea actually, you know, throws uh, the understand or misunderstanding between the Koreans and keep this, um, you know, misunderstanding and uh, lack of communication and lack of understanding actually uh, gives the, you know, does the bad job towards the reconciliation and final unification. Sim North and South Koreans simply don't understand what is going on on the other side of the Dimitri zone. They, uh, both North Pyong Seoul and Pyongyang claim the sole legitimacy on the peninsula. They, there's no way they, they're going to accept the other. They're not going to uh, legitimize or recognize the existence of the other regime. And, well, it effect effectively prevents the reconciliation because to reconcile you need to know something about each other, you need to talk, you need to, you know, sit down and iron out your differences. But the propaganda on both sides creates and uh, kind of many, uh, sort of entrenches these differences and m often misrepresents uh, the other and it's not very helpful. But foreigners often play a uh, role in this and propaganda in Korean War is continuing and I believe that we often become part of that, particularly when we go to North and South Korea. Thank you very much.